Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Canadian jazz guitarist Mike Rudd. Over the course of our interview, he discussed his love of Montreal, jazz, and being a musician. He just won a Juno Award for his latest album, Notes on Montreal. And the backstory on this album is quite cool. He also went on to discuss a solo project in the works, teachers he's had over the years, who some of his jazz heroes are, a dream gig he'd love to see in a time machine, along with much, much more. Please dig this, my friends. Thank you for taking a little time to talk with me. I appreciate it. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Right on. Let's go ahead and start here and talk to me a little bit about what has been going on with you lately. Um, well, uh, I guess musically, uh... The last couple of years were busy. Um, I got really ambitious back about in 2009, 2010, and I started work on a really unusual album for a jazz guitar player. Um, I'm a Montrealer. It's an adopted city for me, um, and I love the place. And there's a rich body of literature set in this city. That describes it like like there is pertaining to New York or Boston or one of those cities. So I decided to to read a bunch of that literature, soak in the city as much as possible, and then write uh, a connected song cycle of songs that uh, that describe the city as it's been described in that literature, and uh, and that that would be the music and the lyrics. Um, and then I got uh, a fantastic vocalist, uh, Sienna Dallin, is her name, yeah. to, uh, to sing it for me. And I also, uh, you know, we wonderful rhythm section and uh, scored it out for a string quartet. Um, so, so it's a nine-piece band, and, and between the, the reading the books, uh, writing the material, arranging the music raising the funds for this sort of behemoth project from beginning to publication it was probably just about four years wow um and uh but it turned out just beautifully i've, I've never been so proud of anything um that's about two, two years ago that uh, that i published that and it wound up winning the uh, juno award which is uh yeah kind of a, kind of a big deal here in canada it's it's our it's our national music award so we won the vocal jazz juno for it uh, but uh, then we got to play it a lot, and that was wonderful. But in the course of doing that, you can imagine how fatigued I would get from uh, all the logistics in, in, in a nine-piece band and a giant literary project like that. So I started working on a kind of an exact opposite, which is just a solo jazz guitar record where I play and sing, uh, and there's no, there's no band. Uh, so it's these fairly souped up arrangements about half the time. Some really, really intense guitar arrangements um, of standards, mostly of standards. Uh, so it's these two kind of very opposite projects that uh, between the two of them, um, it's looking like I'm going to be as busy as any jazz guitar player in Canada has a right to be. Yeah, well, it sounds like you got your yin and yang. That's a pretty big deal. You know, I know that Juno is kind of the Grammy equivalent here in America. Um, Oh, I was so excited about it, yeah, and, and everybody on my team there was, uh, it was, it was a real, it was a real shot in the arm, you know, because when you're working on something that's that far out of the uh, mainstay of, of uh, traditional jazz or, or even modern jazz, uh, it's, you kind of wonder, well, have I, have I, have I gotten too far away from, from what matters to, to my audience, and in fact, no, it turned out no, this is what this is, this is the kind of thing they were they were looking for people to do, you know. Well, it's the ultimate love letter to the city that you live in, you know. I totally, uh, I, I, my heart was in it one thousand percent of the time, and then I really, since then, I feel like I got, I really did get it said and got something out of my system because I used to walk around kind of always thinking about that aspect of the place, kind of romanticizing the place, and since. All the kerfuffle over the record and everything. I, I feel like uh, I feel a lot more down to earth and everyday about the place. Like I don't, uh, I'm not quite so haunted by it as as I was. But man, for those few years, I was, uh, 
I was living that project every single day. Yeah, that's great, man. So, did you grow up in Montreal? Not at all, no, and I think that's one of the reasons why I can kind of be like a kid with his nose pressed up against the glass uh, at, in the place. Um, I'm My dad was military, uh, and we lived all over Canada, mostly in western Canada, and uh, and even uh, for one year down in San Antonio when I was in grade school. And, and so when I first saw Montreal, I was in high school, and it was like a school trip, and I couldn't believe it. It was like... I've still never been to Europe, but it's it's a lot closer to what I'm told and what I imagine a European city is is like. It's really walkable. It's really, you know, it's it's uh, there's there's charming things about all the Canadian places, but uh, Montreal's really got something all of its own. And uh, not being raised here helped me to kind of see that. I think. I have heard nothing but absolute magical mysticism about Montreal between. <laughs> Between Montreal and Prague, people gush about those cities. Yeah, you know, that's the comparison. And I think because the thing it reminds me of about Prague or uh, is, is, I mean, not that I've ever been to Prague, but, but a lot of people were going and spending a few years in Prague because it was a cheap European place to live. And you can really, and, you know, Americans especially, I notice more and more, but also some Europeans are really doing that here. Like, it's a, it's a great lifestyle city for a really reasonable cost of living. Yeah. You know, I've heard similar things, not about the cost of living, but about the lifestyle, uh, um, uh, about sort of, and I guess the historicity of between Montreal, sort of New Orleans and San Francisco. Yeah. You know, that these, these are places with deep roots, or as you guys like to say, roots. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they, 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 they carry a lot of history with them. They're full of ghosts. Um, that's always really appealed to me. Yeah, that's wonderful. So growing up, the way you did kind of moving around, how did you acquire this love of music and jazz and to grow up to be a jazz guitarist? Well, um, for the first few years that I played, it was all Beatles tunes, which is probably why I picked up this fierce love of, of lyric stuff and really melodic music. Um, and then... You know, my school programs were full of music, were full of jazz music. And, uh, you know, high school, where I was in Edmonton, in, in, in Alberta, like just north of Montana there. Um, and we had, a, we had a really powerful high school music program. And uh, that got me started. And, and really, that was just at the beginning of when jazz education programs were, were starting to happen in in uh, you know, in, in places like colleges and universities. So after high school, I kept I kept on it and did a bunch of post secondary music education, um, and it was all jazz, jazz oriented at the time. And, and I fell in love with the music. There's so much about 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 jazz, both as a tradition and as a kind of challenges it throws at, at improvisers um, that I love and. Also, as I get older, the kind of friendships, I mean, you really get to know people when you're playing that music, and they're very beautiful people, most jazz musicians, really fulfilled. The more people I get to know, the luckier I feel that I became a jazz musician, because it's, it's, uh, they're, they're really good people. Yeah. Um, they're happy, you know? Yep. And uh, that, that you, I guess I could kind of see that early on. That was part of the selling point, but I was just in love with I just burned for that. So, like the first time I heard Milestones. You know, yeah, and all that stuff. Cannonball plays all over that, and 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 West Montgomery and all that. I mean, I just, I could not believe how magical that music was. Um, so it, it was it was impossible to resist. Uh, and then I got lucky. I got as I got older, I got a grant from our uh, our uh, sort of our our equivalent of the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts, and I went down and took guitar lessons with. Uh, Jim Hall in New York in the mid '90s, and uh, that kind of sealed the deal. It was really clear that I wanted to stick with this and try and say something with it. Why did you pick the guitar? Uh, because of the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, I was a guitar player, you know, uh, when I was 11, 12, 13, because I wanted to write and sing tunes, and and still ultimately I do feel like. That's its ultimate appeal for me is, is as a kind of miniature piano. Uh, I don't play 
it that way. I play more like the horn style jazz guitar players because I I got this teacher, this guy named he lives in uh, Pasadena. His name now. Uh, his name is Brian Hughes. He, he plays all these very popular adult contemporary the uh, jazz guitar sort of smooth jazz guitar player. And he he was the first guy I heard play like eighth note and sixteenth note lines like like Pat Martino or Grant Green or something or Pat Metheny and that really hooked me so I, I was already a guitar player I started playing a few other instruments but when I saw what Brian could do and heard those players that he had learned that approach from I was completely hooked something about the way the guitar says a melody but says it with percussion um, it makes medium tempo things really pop out you know when I when I first got into like Charlie Christian I had a guitar I had another early teacher who turned me on to Charlie Christian the first amplified uh, electric jazz guitar player uh, and uh, the, the the way that the notes kind of bubbled out of the recording was just irresistible to me yeah Still is. so did you when you were a kid what did you want to be when you grew up I wanted to be a songwriter I wanted to be a songwriter who could uh, I remember noticing that sometimes there'd be a songwriter who could really play their instrument, you know, like, like uh, or somebody who was known for crafting song, but when they sat down to play an instrument, they weren't screwing around. You know, they yeah. had a real work ethic on it. So, you know, in all sorts of disciplines, I mean, the first place I probably noticed it was, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of country guys like that, you know. They were just, yeah, this person has really spent a lot of time uh, working on this, and it just seemed to me... Uh, and this is, I guess, kind of my bias in terms of what I, the kind of jazz musician I am. Like, I, I, I almost kind of see the ability to improvise on an instrument as the ultimate uh, toolkit for somebody who wants to understand harmony and wants to be able to fashion, like, a good, solid song. So my values as a musician ultimately are towards songwriting and song rendering. You know, especially people like Randy Newman, uh, Jim Croce, Paul Simon, uh, you know, and I named three men, but there's plenty of women that would make that list too. Uh, but then, uh, because of my education, uh, there was always this sort of spring of, of improvising jazz music, and especially you know, in in the, in the American tradition that was at the same time kind of informing it. And uh, and continues to like I've got, uh, I've got plans. I'm doing this solo record right now, and I sing a lot on, on it. But uh, I'm gonna get right back into the the guitar itself as a as a jazz solo or as a jazz instrument in a in a small group context again pretty soon. I think. Very cool. So another part of you is being an educator, and you've been educated well throughout your life, and you've had some great teachers, Don Thompson and Nora Winstone. Talk to me a little bit about what you learned from these teachers. Well, I, 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 uh, Don and Norma, I met them both at uh, the Banff Center for the Arts, and if there's any uh, Americans listening uh, uh, who uh, you know are jazz musicians you may not have heard of this thing and you should look into it and come to it because we get people at this thing every year from all over the world who are, you know, some of the, I was really fortunate to get into it because I, I, I showed up at this, Banff is like this lovely mountain resort town in southern Alberta and it's a month-long workshop they do every summer. I can't remember who's running it right now, but in, the, in years gone by, it's had, uh, it's had people look like Dave Holland running it, and uh, just, you know, I don't know, 50 or 60, you know, young, hungry musicians uh, are brought in, you know, apply, and are brought in, and and they just live at that center for a month and do courses with each other. Um, and it's not beholden to any particular curriculum except for whatever the most recent and forceful ideas are uh, for from from the teachers, so so it's a a beautiful hybrid of wide open and and uh, focused and and uh, uh, and high octane. So I met Don and Norma because they were on staff at Banff at that point. That was the same time I met Jim Hall, 
uh, just about everybody I've ever talked to who went to that place said uh, uh, it'll change your life. And uh, it certainly did, because it was after that that I, I went down to New York to study more with Jim. Um, Don Thompson, uh, D-O-N Thompson, in Toronto, oh, he's on a lot of recordings. He's, he's um, one of these amazing multi-instrumentalists. His, I don't know which he's stronger as, a, an upright bassist or a piano player, but he's absolutely top drawer on both of those things. I've spent a lot of time wondering just exactly what music sounds like to that guy, because every time he sits down to play, he's so collected. Yeah, encyclopedic and poetical, beautiful touch, everything, so much background, and Norma, oh my god, I have trouble thinking of a singer I, I like better than her, I, I went back and visited Banff later, because I had the good fortune of being from northern Alberta, uh, so the following year, I just showed up and spent a couple of nights, you know, on somebody's dorm floor, and Norma let me come into her class, and I'm a guitar player, but she let me in there to, to, to sing along with her singers, you know, and there's a group of people who are kind of curated, there, there were probably, uh, you know, several dozen singers, far better than I'll ever be, who didn't get to go to Banff that year, but, but you know, I was an hour away by car, and I, and I could just pop down and check it out, and she, she was super sweet to me, and it was, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, She's a great, you know, if you listen to the Kenny Wheeler stuff um, that she's on, like music for large and small ensembles, um, or her solo stuff, she's wonderful at doing something brand new with, with the traditional material. Uh, and she really made, made her own way with that. And she was a patient and kind teacher. Really couldn't say enough good things about both of those guys. So along with having quality teachers, you've played with a lot of quality individuals over, over the years. Kenny Wheeler, Herb Ellis, P.J. Perry, you know, the list goes on and on, Randy Brecker. What is it like to play and be on stage next to people that are so journeyed and wise and good at what they do in the jazz craft? That's uh, it's, it's an honor when that happens. And, and the overwhelming impression I've been left with over the years is that, uh, you know, at first you're always a little intimidated because they've, by definition, those, those are people who have done very much what you wish you could do. And you want to know, you, can't, you, you wouldn't be human if you didn't want to know if, if they consider you to have, uh, to have passed muster. Uh, and but you, but you kind of have to park that, and you, and you you kind of have to say, well, if we aren't ultimately both here for the sake of the audience, then I'm not actually interested in this person's opinion. That's kind of how I get through it. It's this sort of passive aggressive thing for the first tune or two, <laughs> and then and then and then what becomes clear is, oh, this person is my fellow traveler. They're way better than me, and they they know way more than me, and I could benefit from a year of lessons with them. But they're at at heart they're um, they're a music addict just like I am, and they've been through the same things I've been through. And if there's anybody who understands how hard it is trying to trying to learn the things I'm trying to learn, it's this person. And about ninety five percent of the time, that's true. Um, especially with the you know the very heaviest players, they they seem to be they're way more interested in just. Making it good and making sure everybody has a good time. Uh, I've had a couple of negative experiences with a, a few, uh, you know, uh, sort of more experienced players, but uh, it, at the end, I never. I concluded it had more to do with personality things than it had to do with, uh, uh, you know, anything else. Uh, I've been pretty impressed with uh, with the humanity of a lot of those great musicians. I, I think partly too that they realize how little. There is a stake financially, you know that there's that there's just, we, you know, the gig still only pays uh, a little tiny bit, and and we're here for a good time, not for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. You kind of touched on that earlier on about how amazing jazz musicians are, and I'm always con- constantly in the process of interviewing jazz musicians all over the place, and how Ma- and from a Maslowian hierarchy how fulfilled these human beings seem to me but also how humble they are and the talents that they harbor it's amazing 
Right, right. Well, I mean, uh, I guess they, they, yeah, I, I don't know, but it seems to me that they often, they often see that as, it's like, if they were on a desert island, half of those people would be, they'd be up every morning doing the same thing that they'll do. <laughs> yeah. So they're, 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 you know, generally pretty happy to be in that position, I think. Well, I'm, I'm going to, and I'm going to kind of piggyback off that a little bit, but I first want to ask you, since we're kind of being nostalgic and talking about, you know, really talented players out there, if you could get into a time machine and go back and see a jazz show from any time period, where would you go and what would you see? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I need to remember it because I'm starting to interview musicians. <laughs> um, yeah, well, luckily we burned the Massey Hall concert with Dizzy and Monk and, or Dizzy and uh, Bud Powell and Mangus and Max Roach. Um, it would have been something to be present in the room for that. Uh, um, I would, personally, I would, uh, it's not that far back, but I would love to go back and have been at some of those Bourbon Street nights that the Jim Hall live recordings were made on. Yeah. Uh, those, those were, uh, were really, really exceptional. I got to do it in, uh, four or five months ago with Terry Clark, the drummer on that stuff, and, and uh, I was just, I, I didn't, I, I kind of forgot until the end of the night, oh yeah, that's right, that's Terry on those <laughs> incredible Jim Hall trio days, and, and um, uh, but there's something really, really special about those records. Uh, one that I think I couldn't, I, I think what I would probably list as number one would be uh, any live Charlie Christian baby. Yeah. You know, um, that, uh, that stuff is, uh, there's such power in it, and it swings, and, and when people imitate it, they, I'm still flabbergasted when they, when they get close to it, but boy, you hear the recordings, and it's just, uh, it's devastating. It's interesting, you mentioned Massey Hall, I interviewed an individual out in, uh, Bath, in, in the UK a couple months ago and he has this website called jazzonfilm.com and he knows everything about jazz and yeah. he mentioned that show and said there was no one there because there was a massive boxing match going on at the time uh, with the Massey Hall day? yeah <laughs> he said it was mostly empty it was one of those Trivia Pursuit moments where I'm like I had no idea that I recently heard a story to that effect and there's that great story about them going down the block uh, on the break yeah, uh, and sitting in at some other, <laughs> some other club or something like that. I wish I knew. Uh, I, I got to read up on that stuff. Yeah, it, it's a trip when you really go down the annals of these stories and really get the backstory. Like I heard at one point, Philly Joe Jones used to be a streetcar conductor in Philly, and he would he would leave his streetcar on the street, go into a club and jam for thirty minutes, and come back out like like nothing happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it was like, you guys, no one's getting a ride because I'm jamming, you know, and then I'm coming back out and we're going to act like nothing happened. <laughs> that's right. It's, that's, look, they're getting around town and then there's serious business. There's, there's a much more importance to getting around to your dreams, I think, you know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's got to be done. So speaking of the desert island, if you could, let me ask you this. What's the greatest thing about waking up every day? Um... waking up every day depends that really depends on the day for me um but uh it's uh probably the knowledge that some of these things first i'm just speaking personally I'm, I'm very much driven on like the next uh the next sort of creative goal will it exist will it will it come to pass um will it get out there uh, even if it's only a few hundred people that hear it you know it, there's something uh I'm kind of monomaniacal that way. And and when I wake up in the day and I realize that I've got two or three irons in the fire that are all finally getting somewhere, that really turns my crank. Uh, I can pretty much, on very little sleep, I can put in a very long day at the instrument and in terms of uh, the minutia of making sure that, uh, that gigs are getting booked and so forth. Uh, that when when uh, when it's clear that it's all headed somewhere good, nothing nothing lights me up or motivates me quite so easily as that. That's the best thing about waking up every day. 
Right on. So let's say we hook up in 10 years from now, we talk about what's going on. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, what have you been doing lately, kind of in that MC Escherus way of us beginning this interview? And, and what are you going to want to tell me happened? Oh, man. Uh, do you mean like artistically or in my life in general? <laughs> I think it all kind of is intertwined. I'm aiming at artistically, but obviously you're, the way you live your life, your trajectory is going to have a huge bearing on what you do artistically, I would think. Yeah, right. Well, I've got, and I've always had uh, what I consider to be my own, uh, like a sort of set of values. Um, and I, uh, and for, for what my music is and what I would like to be able to do with it, um, what interests me in, in being able to do with it. So, for example, on that last record, one of the reasons, the one about Montreal, one of the reasons I was so proud of it is that that goal of exploring the city or exploring the place using every tool I had available to me in a really thorough way, that really um, motivated me. And I have similar ones going forward, uh, and they all t they're, they're, at this moment, they're similar themes. They're about mining uh, the world around me for points of interest that I feel to be underappreciated. For example, another record I'd like to do in the next couple of years is uh, more of a singer-songwriter album, um, uh, just solo guitar and voice again, six songs about the Iliad and six songs about the Odyssey. Um, I want to make sure, I've, and I have a few similar ideas to that. I feel like there are some universal themes uh, that can really speak to people that are kind of low-hanging fruit that the current milieu of social media and instant access to the internet and so forth are pushing us away from. We're all afraid that nobody else has an attention span. And yeah. I'm not buying it. I, I think that's just sitting there waiting to be taken back up again it is, is uh, some kind of large narrative. I'm far from the only person to, 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 to be a good candidate for doing it, but I, it's in my heart. Um, and, you know, I, I want to keep finding ways to take what I heard in jazz guitar as a kid that, that so motivated me and finding new ways to say that to an audience uh, so that it uh, keeps bringing back the part that, that dances and sparkles and uh, giving people joy. I want to get better and better and better at that. If I've managed to do that in the next 10 years, uh, I'll, I'll be pretty happy artistically. That's a perfect way to end the, the, the interview right there. That. That, that's a great way to put things. Mike, thanks again for your time. Um, great music, man. I love spending it on the show, and, and keep up the good fight, man. Thanks so much, Joe. Take care, man. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over America, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Mike for his music, time, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.